Hello and welcome to the inside. Sorry for the little delay getting started. We're still working out some of the bugs and using Zoom on a regular basis. But anyway, we made it, we're here. It's the solstice season. In the North, we're heading into winter. Those in the South, you're heading into summer. So it's a time when the circle turns again. For those who want music, to accompany today's class, you can start your playlist now. And as we've been doing, we'll start with a few moments of arriving, of centering. And like we did last week, I invite you to try this sitting on your heels, more sagia style. This is very therapeutic for the knees. So if you have knee issues, you might want to try to do this more and more often throughout the day. But for many people, they just can't get here right away. So again, stacking blocks and things in between the feet. So you sit up a little bit higher, that to take pressure out of the knees. If the ankles bother you, you can put some padding, rolled up towels, socks, blankets underneath the ankles as well. But if for whatever reason, this just doesn't work at all, then simply sit cross-legged. Begin with a moving breathing meditation called the three-part Taoist breath. Begin with the hands at your side. We can exhale here. On an inhale, the arms float out and up, drinking in the breath. As you exhale, bring the hands behind the head, and it's a very stiff, jerky, muscular movement, pushing the walls apart. As you inhale, bring the fingertips to the shoulders. As you exhale, push the hands forward, rounding your back, drop the head towards your chest. The palms turn up, inhale, reach up. You can even look up a bit of a back bend, exhale to the earth into child's pose. But we don't stay here, we flow again. Inhale, rising. Exhale to the side. Drawing in, reaching out. Lifting up, inhale. Bowing down, exhale. Two more cycles. If you memorize the dance, you can do this with your eyes closed. Exhale to the side. Drawing in. Pushing out. Reaching up. Bowing down. The last cycle rising to the side. Drawing in. Pushing forward. Reaching up. Bowing down. Two options. You can stay here in child's pose or rise back up to sitting. Close your eyes. Become aware of the earth beneath you as you sit solid and grounded. Become aware of the sky above you as you sit tall like a great mountain. Aware of the space all around you, the temperature of the air against your skin, the light touch of your clothing. And to all of this, add an awareness of the breath within you. Noticing what happens as you happen to breathe.
couple more breaths. And you can slowly open your eyes, lean back to release the legs, massage the knees and circle the ankles. We're ready for the inside. Physiologically, our target area today will mostly be the spine. But at another level, we're going to investigate the, the concepts of time. This is the time of year when the calendar turns, the wheel spins again, the cycle repeats. So we're going to begin with a few cyclical poses. We're going to start with dangling. So coming up. Bend your knees, have your feet hip width apart or more, and bend enough that you can bring your hands to the floor. Now, so for some people who just can't do dangling, your option will be to do a caterpillar pose. Just sit down, perhaps sitting on something, bend your knees and just allow yourself to come forward. But for those who can dangle, go ahead and keep your knees bent quite a bit at first. The hands on the floor so you can Decide how much weight you want to have in the upper body. Another option is to rest your elbows onto your thigh. The intention here with dangling is to let the spine decompress. It's like we're applying attraction through gravity. So allow yourself to kind of really release the upper body here. Now with the knees bent, the lower body is working a bit. So we will find both yin and yang in this pose. The upper body in yin mode, relaxing, releasing. The lower body in a little bit muscular effort, yang mode, because the knees are bent. There's different ways to do this dangling or uttanasana, forward fold. You can do it with the legs straight, which makes it more of a hamstring stretch. Or you can do it with the knees bent, which makes it more of a quad strengthener. But for this first visit, let's keep the knees bent chest towards the thighs. We'll be here for about 30 more seconds and I invite you to notice how the head feels nice and heavy. You can get the sense there's a traction in the neck and the lengthening all along the spine. Again, if this becomes too much, just do the version sitting down. Just do a caterpillar pose. Two more breaths here. And the lovely counter pose for dangling is called squat. So from here, simply sit down. Now naturally your feet will go out a little bit. If you find that you don't have the ankle flexibility to easily squat down, two options. One is just to do butterfly. So for the track one students, perhaps butterfly is a nice appropriate option for you. The other option is to have a block or some sort of support underneath your heels. Lifting the heels up actually creates more range of motion in the ankles. And maybe now you can come to the squat without any effort. You might need to have two blocks side by side in order for your feet to be wide enough for this. For the track two and three students who are naturally a little bit more flexible, they ne won't necessarily need something underneath the heels. They can just come into the regular squat. There is a tendency in squatting for people to be fascinated by their floor, their mats, their carpets. And although that can look very psychedelic, um, instead, see if you can lift the chest up. Dropping the head down tends to bring the center of gravity more forward, which will help you stay balanced. But if you can lift the chest up, maybe drop the tailbone down, See if you can find the balance there. Now, if you want, you can bring the hands together into prayer. If you have your arms in front of the knees, that drawing the knees backwards may help to also bring the center of gravity a bit more forward. Some people find it easier to balance here. A nice counter movement for people who do a lot of down dog is to bring back the hands together, kind of a reverse prayer position. So you get a lovely little stress to the back of the hands. 
And then you decide where you want to point your reverse prayer hands. You can point in towards yourself. You can maybe point down to Mother Earth, your choice. We're going to linger here for another breath or two. Noticing what your experience is. Where do you feel the challenge in this pose? Now, there's a lovely counter pose to squatting. And that posture is called dangling. So from here, we straighten the legs, come back to dangling. And that's all we're going to do today for an hour. We're going to dangle and squat, dangle and squat. It's going to be a cycle like the year. I'm just kidding. For this visit to dangling, if it's available to you, then do straighten your legs and see if you can clasp your elbows. <clears throat> that's not available to everybody. Some people may still need to keep the knees bent maybe resting the elbows onto the thighs or hands to the floor. But for the track two and three students, if you can do it, clasp your elbows. Track three, those who are very flexible can clasp the elbows behind the legs. And again, for those that just can't do the dangling, come out and just do the seated straight leg forward fold. <clears throat> Remember track three is not where we're trying to get to. Track three is only an option for people who have no choice. They don't feel anything in the track one or two positions. So don't feel like you have to somehow get to track three. If you're not feeling anything in track two, then sure, try three. But if you're already feeling it, then you're doing it. So for another 30 seconds here, again, feel like your upper body is relaxing. It's yin mode. It's like the water falling over the granite cliffs of your legs, the waterfall, your head heavy, so the neck gets that nice releasing traction. And remember the counter pose for dangling was squat. So one more time, we sit down and do a squat. We listen to all the knees go snap, crackle, and pop. That's for the needy people. We need to stress the knees, but not too much. If your knees are damaged, you still need to exercise them on a regular basis, but you don't overdo it either. So through experimentation time, you kind of play with this to figure out what's the appropriate level of stress for your knees. And over time, you might find you can do a little bit more, stay a bit longer, but the knees are designed to, to flex like this. But again, if there's pain, then you wanna back off. And pain can arise kind of in three ways. While you're in the pose, in which case come out right away. When you come out of the pose is maybe when you feel the pain, in which case you have to think, well, next time I come into this particular shape, I need to come out a little bit earlier. And sometimes it, the pain doesn't arrive until the next day. And then you have to think back, what have I been doing over the last day or two that may have triggered this? But pain, again, is usually a one-way ticket out of the pose. And then you come back to it slowly, gently, playing the edge over time. I'm just doing a lot of talking at first to distract you from how challenging the squats can be. This is a little bit of a flexion for the lower back. Your lumbar spine is completely flexed here, but your upper back is not too flexed. It's more neutral. And that's just preparing us for the journey to come. But we're really going to focus today on extending the spine. One more breath here. <clears throat> and then sitting back to come out of the pose. Release the legs. And I invite you to lie down. So come all the way down, little mini shavasana, letting the spine just release your hands to your side. The feet fall out or inwards, that depends on you. Close your eyes. Just feel the echo of those opening movements. Feel the rebounding quality. Focusing 
on the sensations through your core, through the spine. Another breath or two here. Enjoy it while you can. And from here, roll onto your stomachs. We're gonna come into the Sphinx pose. Sphinx pose is a fairly nice little back bend. But for some people, coming onto the belly like this puts a bit too much stress into the belly. This may be because you had a big meal before you started class today, which is generally not a good idea. Or people who are pregnant, they may not want to have their belly pressing into the floor. So one option is to get a bolster and place it right underneath the thighs, the top of the thighs, and then grab some other blocks or another bolster and have your elbows resting on those. So this may be your sphinx pose. And this is lovely, especially for women who are very pregnant, seven, eight, nine months pregnant. There's a nice space here for the belly with no pressure. So for any reason, lying on your stomach just doesn't feel appropriate today. You can try this option. For regular people just doing the sphinx pose, just coming onto your elbows, maybe clasp the elbows and walk them a little bit out in front of you. It doesn't matter if the shoulders are way up or you're sinking into the shoulders. The targeted area here is the lower back. And as long as you're feeling something, some form of compression into that lower back area, then you're getting the pose. We're getting the stress in the targeted areas. You have a choice, you can let the head drop down, get a nice stress for the back of the neck. Some people like to extend the neck as well. But for many people, when they lift the head up, that can compress the vertebral arteries, which bring about 15 to 20% of the blood supply to the brain flows through the vertebral arteries. And when people lift their head up, that reduces that blood flow and they start to feel dizzy, nauseous, or even a headache. So in that case, just let the head drop down. You can rest your head onto a block maybe, so it feels supported, or you can rest your head into your hands. Now, we've already been here for a while, and for some people, that first sensation in the lower back has already started to ebb away. So another option at this point is to bend the knees, bring the heels towards the buttock, and you might find that that increases the sense of compression, the level of stress in the lower back. Now, we'll go deeper later, but for now, just be where you feel this. Remembering our three principles of the install of practice. First is we come to the edge. We come to that place where we feel something in the target area. And then we become still and we hold for time. Remembering time is the magic ingredient in the install of practice. And time is also something that we become perhaps more aware of, the long-term passing of time when we reach the solstice seasons, especially the winter solstice where we turn the page in the calendar. Soon a new year will be upon us. And once again, the wheel of time turns. And it's generally at this time of the year that we pause to Think about the year that we've had, perhaps the year ahead. The idea of the cycles of time was something that developed by the astronomer priests in ancient civilizations. When humanity discovered that we could control the crops. We could decide to plant crops and reap the harvest. It became important to be able to tell time. Hunter-gatherer communities, they didn't really have to worry so much about the passage of the seasons. But for agricultural communities, that was very important. We had to know when was the time to 
to sow, when was the time to reap? The first calendars were invented then by watching the stars, the movement of the sun, the moon, the planets. And through the repetitive cycles in the heavens, we started to conceive that there would be repetitive cycles here on earth as well. Cycles of the sky became cycles of society. We have about three more breaths here. On your next exhale, slowly lower down. Turn your head to one side, rest your cheek on your palms. Whichever way you turned your head, slide that knee alongside you on the floor. Just to release the lower back. And I invite you to close your eyes and interiorize your awareness. Notice what you're feeling. We're just on one cycle of the Sphinx. We'll do another cycle in a moment. But for now, just enjoy this little holiday. It was the Babylonian astronomers that decided to create a calendar that had 360 days in the year. 360 being one of these magical numbers. There was 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour. <clears throat> you multiply them together, you get 3,600 seconds in an hour. So they started to measure degrees of space in 360 units. And they also measured degrees of time into 360 as well. The second, the minute, the number of days. But of course, a year is 365 days. So we always had these five extra days at the end of the year, which were kind of the bonus times. It's a bit like the rebound period between yin yoga poses. That's our bonus time. So now we're going to come back and do our second set of the Sphinx. So again, come back to where you left off. Clasping the elbows, maybe walk the elbows a little bit out in front of you. If the knees are bent, you can go back there. And you notice how this feels. And only if you're not feeling anything. And if you're already feeling this, then stay here. All we intend to do is get to the place where there's sensation. But if you're attract two or three students who is not feeling anything here, then you can make the pose a little bit more challenging by bringing a block or some bolsters underneath the elbows, lifting the chest a bit higher, creating more of an extension, more of a back bend here. And again, you can add bending the knees. Now, for most people, this will be adequate. And we're not trying to get to the maximum amount of sensation. We just want to be where there's enough sensation so that as we linger for time, we get the benefits. For the few students who still don't feel anything, you can transition to the seal pose. The seal pose, you turn the hands outward and then straighten your arms. A lot of people do seal pose in an egoistic way. They think they want to become like track three. So they're in Sphinx, their hands are out here, and then they straighten their arms. They haven't really changed the amount of back bend, but now they have to struggle to stay here. They need the muscles to keep their arms straight. The actual seal is to slide the hands inward. So they're almost under the shoulders and then straighten the arms. So the arms are not muscular and engaged at all. We're just hanging into the bones here. But if this creates any tingling in the hands or the fingers, then it's better to come out and just do a version of Sphinx pose with the elbows supported. Now, for some people, it's better to have the block underneath the chest. And this version of Sphinx pose is more appropriate. You're supported, but you still have a bit of a back bend here. So you're doing the version of sinks that works for you. 
And once you can feel that edge, just stay there. Close your eyes and interiorize your awareness. So many of the ancient agricultural civilizations, observing the skies became their way of telling time. And time in all these societies was cyclical, which is a common thing to think of. Every day, the sun rises and the sun sets. Next day, it's repeated. There's the cycle of the, the day. And then there's the cycle of the month, the month. The cycle of the moon, it takes 29 and a half days for a full moon to become the next full moon. <clears throat> That's one moon. And so a month is usually about 29 and a half days. Well, you can't have half a day, so it's 29 or 30 days. Then astronomers always had difficulty reconciling the lunar calendar to the solar calendar, because the 29 days of the moon did not divide equally into 365 days of the sun. And societies had to decide, do they want to follow a lunar calendar or a solar calendar? And it created all sorts of havoc. <clears throat> there were longer cycles as well. The cycle of the year, the cycle of Venus and Jupiter. There were eight-year cycles and 12-year cycles and longer 26,000-year cycles where the whole zodiac and the constellations revolve one turn. But this gave rise to the idea that in life, things were repeated. Things would happen again and again. And so there were cosmological stories that talked about the golden age of yesteryear and how we've slipped into the decay. And at the end of the decay, the whole universe will stop and then start again. A great flood or a great fire will destroy the universe and the clock will start up again the grand cycles of time. And even the gods could do nothing about the passing of time. They were just agents of the cycle. They couldn't influence it. They couldn't change it. They couldn't stop it. They were just actors in a play, like all of us. And then the play would be told again tomorrow and the next night and the night after that. So let's again lower down. This time, turn your head to the other side. Slide that knee alongside you. And here's our little holiday. <laughs> the little five days at the end of the 360, the cycle of the, the year. So enjoy this brief respite. Closing your eyes. Into your eyes, your awareness. Notice how you're feeling. In South Asia, these cycles of the time were referred to as the yugas. And the yugas lasted for a very long time. But then when the universe would start, we'd be in something called the Satya Yuga. And this would last for four normal yugas. And this was when everything was beautiful. People would live for 100,000 years. You were born with your soulmate. You never had to go find her or him. Everyone behaved appropriately. We didn't need any teachings because life was just inherently proper. But then with the turning of the years, the Satya Yuga turned into the Trecha Yuga, the next cycle. And here people only lived to be a thousand years old. And people still behaved fairly well towards each other, but there were some things decaying. Things weren't working as well as they used to. And then the wheels turned longer and we entered the Dwapara Yuga. People only lived to be 100 years old. And people have forgotten how to behave. So a book was given to humanity called the Vedas. And in these Vedas were the laws for society to follow because we didn't naturally know how to, to live. And then we turned into our current age, the Kala Yuga where people only live to be 40 to 100 years old. Even the Vedas don't help us. We're ending, heading towards the end of times where it's all gonna get washed away and then the grand cycle will repeat itself. 
And from lying on your stomach, roll over onto your back. We're gonna come into one of my favorite poses called the supported bridge. Now, hopefully you all have some blocks or supports. We're gonna start with the knees bent, feet on the floor. Bring your block or your support right beside the hips. And then by pushing your feet down, lift your hips up enough that you can bring your block or your support right underneath the pelvis. Now these long, broad bolsters, they're excellent for this, but if you don't have them, if all you've got are these type of blocks, make sure they're on their flattest setting. Don't put them on their edge because then they could fall over. Plus they concentrate too much stress in one small area. So be on the flattest setting. The track, three students may need to stack a number of blocks together. Just go to where you feel like this is appropriate. Now track one, this is it, you just stay here. Track two and three, you can slowly start to walk the legs straighter. Now you start to feel nice tugging on the top of the hips. These are your hip flexors. And then the last option is to clasp the elbows over your head. Now as you do that, make sure you're not getting any tingly sensation in fingers. Some people, when they bring their arms over their head, they start to compress the nerve bundle that innervates the arms, or they can even compress an artery called the subclavian artery, which feeds blood to the arms. So for some people, bringing their arms over the head makes their hands go to sleep, or they get the tingling feelings. So if that happens to you, you can rest your forearms onto your forehead or onto a bolster or a block, some support there. If that doesn't get rid of the tingly feeling, then just lower the arms down. Now, this is a very yin-like pose. It's very passive. You can just hang out here for a long time, closing your eyes. Again, time is more important than intensity here. So don't be worried about how much you're feeling here. For many people, when they're in the supported bridge, they don't really feel much at all until they come out of the pose. It's when they come out of the pose, they realize, oh yes, there was something going on there. So I invite you to close your eyes. And while we're hanging out in the supported bridge, I wanna share with you another model of time. As I mentioned in the ancient high agricultural communities, time was cyclical. Time repeated itself. And the whole idea of the yugas, there was a repetition. We go through these, these yugas and then the universe would end and a new universe would start up again. And it would be exactly the same as the previous universe. So in this philosophy, you've heard me say this an infinite number of times before. And you'll hear this again and again. So if you get a slight sense of deja vu, it's because time repeats itself, exactly. And you really have no control over any of this. You're just fated to repeat the same things that we've always done in past universes. And that was a pretty common philosophy throughout the ancient worlds until the time of the Persians. In the Persian philosophy, the religion was called Zoroastrian, um, named after the, the great prophet Zoroaster. That's the European name for him. The Persian name was Zarathustra. But in this philosophy, it was a very different creation mythos. Because in the beginning, there were two great powers. There was Ahura Mazda, the god of light and everything good, and his twin brother, Angra Mainyu, the god of darkness and evil. Now, Ahura Mazda was omniscient. He knew everything. He wasn't omnipotent. He couldn't do everything because his twin brother was also quite powerful, but he kind of knew what was gonna happen. He could first tell the future. And he knew that time was linear. There was no great cycles in this philosophy. The universe would last for exactly 12,000 years. And for the first 3,000 years, the two brothers contended in the spiritual world. One day, before there was any days, Angra Manu went out for a walk. And as he crested the hill, he noticed this beautifully horrible light 
and he hated this light, so he attacked it. But Ahura, Ahura Mazda beat him back. And so Angra Manu went back to his dark chasm. And during that first 3,000 years, Ahura Mazda created all the great spiritual things, like the spirit of humanity. And Angra Manu created all sorts of dark spirits. At the end of this first cycle of 3,000 years, Ahura Mazda materialized his creations. Humanity was placed upon the earth. So first Ahura Mazda created the heavens and the water, then he created the earth, then he created the plants, the animals, then he created the moon, the sun, the stars. And into all this, he put Gaiomart. Gaiomart was the first, first human being. And along with him came his faithful ox. Sounds a bit like the story of Paul Bunyan and Babe, his favorite ox. But this ox was called Govrasan. The go is also common to the Indian word for cow as well. We have the gopis and uh, gomakasana, the cow faith pose. For 3,000 years, Gilmart lived on the earth. And things were pretty good until Angra Mainyu rose up again and started to pour evil into the world. At this point, when have you come out of the pose in the reverse way that you went into it. So first bend your knees, walk your feet in towards your hips, and then don't lift your hips very much, but stiffen your core, lift your hips about a half an inch and slide the bolsters away. And then slowly allow your back to slowly roll vertebra by vertebra onto the floor. Pause there with the knees bent for a moment. And when you feel it's time, you can slide the legs straight and enjoy the rebound of the bridge pose. Groaning may help. Pause here for a moment. It was time for the third cycle. Now into the third cycle, we had constant battles between Ahura Mazda's creatures of light and Angra Mainyu's creatures of darkness. Angra Mainyu attacked, sickened Gayomart until he finally died. But from his remains, from his seeds, came the rest of humanity. And humanity was given a choice by Ahura Mazda, even when they were in the spirit realm. Ahura Mazda came to the the spirit of humanity and said, listen, you can choose to either help me fight against evil, in which case the whole universe will only last 12,000 years. You'll be sickened, you'll be suffering, you'll be pain. But at the end of 12,000 years, you'll be resurrected. You'll be given the perfect body and will live forever in peace. And there'll be no more evil ever. Or you can not help me, in which case evil will last forever and will always have this continual struggle. And so the spirit of humanity chose to fight on the site of light and goodness and contend against evil. Now, slowly roll up to sitting. We're gonna come into another one of my favorite poses called saddle pose. Now saddle pose is not available to everybody, but if you're a track three student and you already know saddle pose, and you can go all the way to the floor, then I invite you to go into it right now. Just come into saddle and stay here, but you'll be here for a while because you're track three. <laughs> track two students who can't quite get to the floor, or if you're pregnant, you can maybe just come onto a bolster. You can maybe stack some blocks underneath the bolster so it's more of an angled bolster and come into this version. But for the rest of track one and two students, we're gonna come into this pose very differently. I'm gonna invite you to again, come onto your back. Have your feet as wide as the mat. We're gonna come into it through windshield wipers. So you drop your knees from side to side a few times. Just kind of wake up the legs. And then drop both knees to one side. Notice which side you've done, because later we're gonna do the other side. To the degree you can, try to bring that 
foot up beside the hip. Track two students, you might be able to bring the foot right beside the hip, in which case move your hips a bit down so the knee's on the floor. If the knee's floating a little bit, that's okay. If this is painful for the knees, put a block or some support underneath the knee. So just find the place where you can be here for a while. Again, it may be a very simple windshield wiper and that's okay too. Another option is to place the other knee on top of it or a foot on top of that knee. If you want, you can add the hands over your shoulders. Now for the track three students who are all the way on the floor, a little special addition for you. Clasping your elbows, move your upper body as far to one side as you can. This is like a banana in the saddle. So we got a banana riding the saddle here. So just come over, keep the lower body where it is. That's still in the normal saddle position. You're just adding this side bend. And I'll let you know when we're about halfway through this so you can switch to the other side. So after another cycle of contention between the forces of darkness and the forces of light, we head towards the final cycle, the final 3000 years. And this is where the great prophet Zoroaster comes and he's battling against the forces of evil. And then when he dies, his seed is left in a lake and a great Messiah is gonna arise at the end of days from the seed a woman goes bathing in the lake and gives a vir virgin birth to this Messiah, Sheosant. And Sheosant leads the final battle with the sons of light against the sons of darkness. And he wins that battle, finishing out the 12,000 years of contention. The forces of evil have been defeated. Everything that was evil goes down to hell for three days where they're purified and then everything becomes good again. And all that's left is light. And so everyone who ever lived is reborn, giving a perfect body, either a 25 year old body or a 40 year old bo body, depending on when they died. And that is the, that's the end of time. Everyone lives together in Eve eternity. Eve eternity is this place where time does not pass. It's the place where God and the angels lived before time was even created. So in this philosophy, we have the idea that time is not circular. Time is linear. There was a beginning and there will be an end. Now we're halfway through on this side. So those that are doing the windshield wipers, bring your legs to the other side. For those in all the way back in saddle pose doing the banana asthma, slowly make your way over to the other side as well. But again, no rush to get there. Just make it kind of easy. We're not symmetric. So if people are doing the windshield wiper over to the other side, you might find that knee doesn't go down as far. Or maybe that knee goes down really easily and you can then tuck that foot beside you or weight the knee down. And again, if this is bothersome for the knee, put some supports, put some blocks underneath the knee just to take the ouchiness out of the knees. And while all the ancient cultures had this idea of time being circular, cycles that repeat themselves, the Persian idea became the default idea in the West. This occurred due to the Babylonian exiles of the Jewish people. Back in around 590 BCE, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon captured, conquered the Jewish people and took about half the population back to Babylon. And they lived there for about 40 years until Cyrus the Great, the great Persian king, conquered Babylon. And he freed the Jewish people, but a lot of them decided to stay there in Babylon. And by staying there, they were exposed to this Persian idea of time, that time was linear. There was a beginning and there'll be an end of days when the forces of good will fight the forces of darkness. So this became part of the lore of the Jewish people. This is the idea of the, the Essenes who lived at the, the Dead Sea, the scrolls that we recovered, the Dead Sea scrolls a few decades ago. They talked about this forecast of the end of time coming. There's even some scholars who believe that John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, um, Paul of Tarsus, 
They were apocalypticists. They believed that the end of time was upon us. The whole writings of the apocalypse of, of St. John. This is all envisioning the end of times happening right now in that generation. And the forces of darkness were the Romans. And they believed the sons of light, they themselves, would be the victors as they conquered the darkness. Unfortunately, they read these, these mythological stories literally instead of metaphorically. But ever since that time in the West, we believe that time is linear. We don't have these cycles. Now, somehow we're gonna come out of this boat. <laughs> Those doing the windshield wipers, simply bring your legs back to center and then slowly straighten the legs. Those that are all the way back into saddle pose, you have two options. You can come up the way you went down, kind of propping yourself up into your elbows, or you can slowly roll to one side, groaning as you come out. Or the more flexible students, you can simply lift the knees up and then slide the legs out. But let's all make our way onto our backs with the legs straight and just pause here. Another little holiday. Feel the echo of the previous poses. Now, today in modern science, we know that time is not secular. We believe there was a big bang. We're not really sure how the universe will end. It may all collapse again and create another big bang, which may make it, may make it circular, or it may continue expanding forever. But our view of time is more of a spiral. We know that we do have cycles. The seasons do follow each other, but we progress forward. The cycle of 2021 will not be the same as the cycle of 2022. So it's like we're doing a corkscrew through space time. There's certain patterns that repeat, but last year is not this year. This year is not next year. So we note the differences as time passes, but we also notice the returning circles. The wheel keeps spinning, but it's not a wheel, it's a, it's a spiral. And we're gonna finish with some releasing twists for the spine. So hug the knees into your chest, holding the knees, just gently roll the knees in circles, massaging out the lower back. Often in yoga, we're doing a lot of external rotation in the hips, but today we've been doing some internal rotation. So we're gonna to continue to do that because we do it so rarely with the twisted roots. So bring one knee on top of the other knee, wrapping the legs. Maybe if you're more flexible, you can bring the toe underneath the calf. If you can't do that, just fake it. Whichever knee's on top, drop both knees to the other side. So if your right knee's on top, drop the knees to the left. If the left knee's on top, drop the knees to the right. You can move your hips behind you a bit. You can even rock back and forth a little bit. You can extend the arms out to the side or maybe have one hand hold the knees down. If you have sandbags handy, you can put the sandbag onto that top thigh. But again, as you extend the arms out, check for the tingling. Any tingling, it's better to lower the arms. Some students prefer to clasp the elbows again over their head. <clears throat> so you can do the variation that works for you. You can turn your head away from the top knee, but if that creates any lightheadedness or dizziness, then don't turn your head. And I invite you to close your eyes, interiorize your awareness. I'll be silent now so that you can climb deeper inside the experience that's arising in this moment. It's natural when you're quiet that your mind will create many thoughts. 
That's the nature of mind. Knowing this, make an intention to return. Keep returning your awareness to this moment, to this breath, or to the sensations that are arising right now in your body. This returning is like the turning of time. Keep coming back. And the mind wanders, come back, this breath, this sensation. But one more minute here. On your next inhale, bring the legs back to center. <clears throat> Unwrap your roots. <clears throat> Pause here for a moment. And there's no rush to do the other side. But when you feel ready, go ahead and bring the other leg on top. So make sure you are doing the other side. <laughs> Drop the knees to the side. You can rock back and forth a few times. You might feel a little bit high on the second side. But that's because you just spent five minutes getting nice and low on the first side. So give yourself a chance to open up. Don't force anything. Again, position your hands wherever it feels appropriate for you. You can turn your head away. But again, if that creates any lightheadedness or dizziness, then don't turn your head. 
When you're ready, I invite you to close your eyes and to your eyes, your awareness. Notice what you're feeling. Mentally come back. Notice what you're feeling in this moment. One more minute here. Last two breaths. And on your next inhale, slowly come back to center. Again, some options, you can hug the knees, Circle the knees, or if you prefer, just be still for a moment. And then we'll finish with Shavasana. 
So take a moment to prepare for final relaxation. You can put on socks, sweater, grab a blanket, make yourself warm, turn off any lights. Then find a position where you can relax. Traditionally, Shavasana is lying on the back, arms and feet to the side, palms turned up. But for some people, lying on the back just doesn't work. Perhaps you're pregnant or you've got back issues, so in which case you can lay on one side, use a, a bolster between your knees. Or other people prefer to do Shavasana with the legs up the wall. A few rare people prefer to do Shavasana sitting. They can do it in a meditation position. So find what's going to work for you. And over weeks and months of experimentation, you might want to try different ways to find out what works best for you. But whichever way you've chosen, take a moment to release. And we'll do this with a few releasing breaths. Begin by exhaling. Then take a deep inhale, fill your lungs, and then with a ha sound, exhale. Try that again. Inhale, feel the lungs, breathe, breathe, breathe. Ah, let it out. And then just release. Become aware of your legs, both legs heavy, relaxed. Become aware of both arms. Allow both arms to release into the earth. Notice how heavy and relaxed your arms are. And then from the tip of your tailbone, slowly, one vertebra at a time, release and relax your spine. Relaxing the sacrum and the lower back. Feel your middle and your upper back releasing, letting go. When you get to be the level of the neck, relax your shoulders, relax your throat, release the neck. And also relax the jaw and all your facial muscles. Through your practice today, at a deep unconscious level, you are stimulating healing energies that flowed through and bathed every cell in your body. So beneath conscious awareness, you are healing, becoming younger, stronger, whole, healthier. And this healing will continue throughout the days and weeks to come without any conscious awareness. But what you are conscious of the growing sense of ease, of peace, a stillness that's filling you. So enjoy this. Enjoy being relaxed. And throughout the days to come, enjoy being.
Now slowly, allow your breath to become a little bit longer, breathing a little deeper. Bring some movement to your fingers and your toes, circling your wrists, circling your ankles, gently rolling your head from side to side, circling your wrists and ankles in both directions. And then a big stretching yawn, reach your arms over your head, interlace your fingers, turn the palms away, take a deep inhale, and then stretch and reach and yawn and make your face as wide as you can, push and pull. And as you release, roll to your left side. And on your left side, use your left arm as a pillow. Pausing here for a moment. Enjoy the rebound from your yawn. And rolling up to sitting. Many of you will leave us now at the end of the asana practice. Some of you will stay for the meditation. For those leaving us here, just to let you know, next week there won't be a live class due to the holidays. The next live class will be January 2nd. The replay of this class, however, will stay up for the next two weeks. So thank you all for joining us. Let's finish with chanting either om or simply humming, covering your heart space with your hands. Begin with an exhale. Take a deep inhale. Om. Until we meet again, Stay safe. Enjoy the solstice season. For those staying for the meditation, just take a moment to relax the legs, massage the ankles and the knees. <clears throat> then find your meditation position, whether that's cross-legged, sitting on cushions, sage style sitting on your feet, whatever works for you. Take a moment to snuggle, get nicely grounded. Then from the floor, through your core, sit up nice and tall. Let the heart open. The shoulders float back and down. The hands relax, relaxing either onto the thighs or fold into the lap. The chin back slightly so the ears are above the shoulders. Tongue to the roof of the mouth, just behind the teeth. And the eyes either closed or cast down on the floor in front of us. We'll begin with an intention. I resolve to awaken to awareness for the benefit of all beings and all things. I appreciate its great value. And I know that it is possible as I am right now without any conditions. Become aware of your breath, allowing each breath to rise and fall. And with each exhale, count one. The next exhale, count two. And keep counting until you reach 10. Once you've reached 10, start over. If you get distracted or lost, then begin again at one.
Remembering like the wheels of time that keep turning. Our practice is one of returning. We get distracted. We notice we're away. We come back. Come back to this breath. And then it happens again. We get distracted. We get taken far away. We remember why we're here. We come back to this breath. Keep returning to the breath.
from time to time, check your posture. If you can sit up a little bit taller, relax your facial muscles, add a soft little Mona Lisa smile, and come back to counting your breath.
Sometimes our thoughts are very seductive. They make us not want to let them go, to keep following them. But remember your intention. Come back to paying attention to the breath, counting the breath.
And the last three breaths. Opening your eyes, lean back to release the legs. One last time, massaging the knees, circling the ankles. As I mentioned, there won't be a live class next week. The next live class will be January 2nd. But this replay will be available so you can watch it as many times as you like until then. So let's finish with a little invocation, intention, skillful thinking will lead to skillful speaking. Skillful intention will lead to skillful action until we meet again. <laughs>